Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett. Welcome to Local Matters. Let's talk about what's happening in our area. Join the Plymouth Public Library in the Phalo Room on October 12th from 7 to 8 p.m. for a talk on women's suffrage and the formidable women right here in Plymouth who are active in the nationwide movement to secure the right of women to vote. Taxation without representation, Plymouth Women and the Fight for Suffrage will be presented by local historian Kathy Geller, who grew up in Plymouth and is now a music teacher at Buckingham Brown and Nichols School in Cambridge, Mass. She'll take you through the Plymouth suffragette journey of working to educate and enroll voters, advocate for voting rights, and help make the passing of the 19th Amendment possible. Visit the Plymouth Public Library website to register. During the summer of 2020, we here at PAC TV began producing a documentary centering on interviews with members of our community and their lived experience of the pandemic. Little did we know we would still be in production one full year later. The story isn't over. Because so much can and has changed, we've decided to give you a sneak peek and check back in one year later with some of our community friends who participated. Next up, we have Plymouth resident and graphic designer, Megan Verdugo, then and now. August 2020, a time of incredible uncertainty, and little did we know we were heading into a winter essentially of isolation. What has this year been like for you? When I saw all of you last, we were looking at a furlough from a job that was about 13 years in the making for my husband and he has since lost that job, found a job and lost the commute to Boston which has also been a huge financial and time boost for him, for us, for our family. Because he's also a musician, he wasn't gigging all of last year and starting in May or June, he started being able to play out again with certain restrictions at certain locations and he's really enjoying being able to play music again. So your career, you are a graphic designer, is that accurate? Yes, I'm a graphic designer and I work from home and I also work as a baker at a farm stand in Bourne called Bay and Farm, which I talked about before. Everybody that works at the farm is vaccinated. And now with the Delta variant, we moved back to wearing the masks just for public safety. We have new equipment in the farm kitchen and we're able to make more cookies and more treats. Sales are up. It's amazing. And, and the it, farm stand? The farm stand is doing phenomenally well. We have some really wonderful customers that are devoted to our products and our organic veggies. Those are two very disparate career paths. So what do you love? Clearly you love working at the farm. What do you love about the farm or working at a farm? Well, I love supporting the production of organic food and local food. That's really the root of why I love the farm. Plus, the farmers are wonderful people. I volunteered for several years in the fields before I started working at the farm and someone else was running the kitchen. And so when the person that left the kitchen left, I was asked to come in because they had tried my chocolate chip cookies. So. And your chocolate chip cookies are legendary in Plymouth and beyond. <laughs> And those chocolate chip cookies sent my child to Japan. I personally bought <laughs> chocolate chip cookies to send her child to Japan. But we have Jacques Torres in the New York Times to thank for that recipe. Well, it's the execution. It's the, the execution. It's all in the execution, yeah. 
and here we are. We're speaking right now in August of 2021, a full year later, mm -hmm. and has this year played out differently than you anticipated the last time we met? I did a few things to help ease my anxiety. And one of the projects I created was with my father, who had started an Instagram series called the Lockdown Series. And he was posting one photo a day for 365 days. And I said, send me the pictures. He sent them to me, not thinking anything would happen. And then I sent him the first chapter. And we put it together pretty quick after that, but he was very excited. Uh, because he has a lifetime's worth of photography and work that he wants to archive and to, to document for posterity. He started writing family histories and finding old photographs uh, that are 100 years old, old glass slides that he would scan and so there's a lot more that has come out of just doing this that I want to document. The way to connect to family was only through the computer, but being able to do this project was able to give him something physical to hold in his hand. Tell me about this. You said you worked on another project as I well? I worked on, I have a friend who also is somebody I've worked with in the past and every day she was having her husband photograph her in a different outfit and she was posting them in her stories on Instagram and we did this together and she was able to write little little bits and pieces about her day how she spent her time during the quarantine what was important to her she has a lot of clever, funny stories about living near and in New York. And the name of this project? The name of this project we called Cued because she <laughs> was quarantined. And so we called it Cued Quarantine Pandemic 2020. COVID has pushed me out of my comfort zone for sure. And given me an opportunity to think about things I wouldn't have been able to think about otherwise. So I am grateful for that, although I'm not grateful for the losses that we've had. Uh, that's a one good thing that's come out of it. At this point, I won't go to the grocery store anymore without a mask, but I won't go out in public without a mask on. Now, because now, of the Delta because variant. Now, because of the Delta, Delta variant, yeah, to protect myself and to protect others. We're entering fall again and COVID is still here. What is your greatest hope for the coming year? My greatest hope for the coming year would be that everyone gets vaccinated. So looking back at this time, what do you think as a society we've done well? You know, we all came together to develop a vaccine and as a society we could definitely treat each other with more kindness, understanding, and empathy. We have a long way to go. I think, again, the good news is the quick action of the world community to come up with a vaccine so that we can end suffering. That's the point of the vaccine, is to end suffering. So I would want everybody to have the advantage of not suffering. Thank you, Megan. It is great to hear and share the bright spots. Next up, the Cordage Park waterfront in Plymouth is the setting for the second annual Glint Music Festival, which celebrates music, art, and heart on October 2nd from 2 to 8 p.m. While artists Duppy Conquerors, Third Left, Young Frontier, and The Pickpockets represent on the main stage, the acoustic stage will feature Haley Sabella, Alicia Shanahan, and Adam Freitas. Head into the artist tent to browse the 24 artists and vendors and sate your appetite and thirst at the on-site food trucks and beer garden. There'll also be a kids zone at this family-friendly event. Joshua Glynn was a man whose foundation was built on love and music, and this festival celebrating his life will also further his life's mission.
Proceeds will benefit the Joshua Glynn Memorial Foundation, bringing music education to children in the local community and around the world. Visit glint.com to learn more. Harbor Health Services, Inc. is a nonprofit public health agency helping individuals achieve their full potential through access to local, affordable services that promote medical, dental, and behavioral health. Julie spoke to Amy Bowen, Director of Community Relations, about the programs and services Harbor Health offers in its five community health centers, one of them here in Plymouth. Amy, it's so wonderful to have you join us today. Can you tell the audience a little bit about Harbor Health and what makes you different from a standard clinic or a standard hospital as a setting for healthcare? Sure, and thank you so much for having us on Local Matters. We're really happy to be a part of this. So Harbor Health is a nonprofit public health agency. We, uh, our mission is to help people that achieve their full potential through access to local affordable services that promote good health. We operate five community health centers, including one here in Plymouth, and two programs of all-inclusive care for the elderly. And we serve communities from greater Boston all the way down through Cape Cod. And what makes us different is that our community health centers, including our one here in Plymouth, are a federally qualified health center. And what that means is that we're able to offer a sliding fee scale and discounts for services based on family size and income. We don't want anything to stand in the way of somebody accessing health care that they need to stay healthy and be happy and safe in their community. So that's really what makes us different. Now, let me ask you a couple things based on what you just said. So a lot of people um, have a, have a health care plan either through their employer or, or through the exchange. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't have health care or they just can't afford it. What do you do right. for the, those people that don't have any um, insurance? Well, we accept all insurances, including health safety net and mass health. Um, when someone comes in and they say, hey, you know, I'm not sure if I, if I qualify for health insurance, but I really need health care. We have folks that are trained in helping people work on what's called the Massachusetts Connector. We're really fortunate to live in a state that has really built that kind of insurance marketplace to make it as accessible as possible for people to, to get health insurance. It, is, it can be something that people need help navigating, and mm -hmm. that's where we can come in. We can help you get health insurance. We can go over what your options are and then connect you to care. And that, you know, we, we take all insurances so that, you know, somebody who comes in, asks for help with insurance, doesn't have to worry about, well, you know, will, will you take my insurance? Right. Where, where do I go now? Now that you've helped yes. me. Yeah. Where do I go next? Yeah. 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 And what's great is that uh, we offer medical, behavioral health and dental services. Dental services, sometimes you can run into um, issues where you know, somebody doesn't take mass health, especially for adults, but we do. So oh, wow. we, we offer full access to dental services as well. Now, the question comes to mind, why wouldn't everybody <laughs> go to Harbor Health? Uh, it, it's a great question. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, you know, I think people have personal connections with their providers. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it, it's all about convenience, the connection that you have with your provider. If you've been with a provider for a long time, they know you. Right. Um, one of the things that our providers uh, focus on is family medicine. And that means they can work with somebody from the time that they are born yeah. to the time that they're, you know, they're, they're working into their golden years. So um, they, they it's, it's, you know, in the biz, we call it continuity of care. But yes. what we really try to do is establish that relationship, work with the whole family, work with the whole person. And, you know, I think building that connection is an important part. And, you know, we understand that some people have um, connections with their providers. Um, we always want to make sure that we respect that. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but also offer them access if they're looking for a new provider, if um, they're new to the community, um, if they've had a change in insurance status so that um, perhaps their current provider doesn't take their insurance anymore. Um, we, we have that perspective that we want to build that relationship with a patient. Now, do you have a number of, of, of physicians um, and specialists right there on staff? Yeah, yeah we have um, seven medical providers. Um, we have four dentists. Um, 
Ours is a, rel and we have behavioral health specialists. We also have a, a full care team. Um, we have um, connections through telehealth to other types of specialists. And we also work with a variety of hospital partners and other networks to make sure if people need a specialist, like cardiologist, for yep. example, that we can connect them to that. And you, we it, really spend at primary care. Okay, so. but so you will help people navigate that that spider web of, of uh, I need to go see a specialist, but the specialist sends me for labs, and how do I do it? And and it's if you're not if you're not used to it, and you, you you're not your own advocate, it can be daunting, and that's what when you say you serve the under the underserved population. Can you give me some examples of underserved populations, like especially here in Plymouth? Yeah, so some examples would be um, lower moderate income individuals, um, individuals that don't necessarily have stable housing, um, individuals with really complex medical needs. Maybe they are in recovery, for example, and um, need access to medication for addiction treatment. Um, there's there's a variety of populations that traditional healthcare systems. Um, know that and understand need some additional support mm -hmm. in navigating the healthcare system, getting the care they need, getting the support they need, um, you know, again, to live a healthy, safe, fulfilling life. Right. Now, you're a 501c3, so you're a nonprofit. How are you funded? Um, we, all, we have, um, we rely on government grants. Yep. Um, we, have, we also look for private funding opportunities. Um, we accept, you know, we, rely on donations, um, but we do get reimbursed for, through insurance mm -hmm. as well. So we have a, a model of care, just like any other um, private practice or hospital system where we're reimbursed for services. Mm. But you know, generally, we, medical, um, medical care, health care, it, it has a lot of operating costs. Yeah. And so we look to offset some of those costs um, and be able to really stretch our resources as much as possible to serve our patients through you know, the government funding, which allows us to offer that sliding fee scale yeah. um, through private foundations and private donations. That's wonderful. Now, during this pandemic, the past year and a half, we're almost mm -hmm. going on two years at this point, how has this affected your the number of people that you're serving and have you seen a huge uptick in the whole behavioral and mental health needs of your uh, patients? Yeah, um, you know, like everybody else, we had to make that really quick shift, um, you know, in March 2020, um, where we, we weren't, we know we needed to be accessible to our patients, especially our patients who tend to live in multi-person households, rely on public transportation, often we're doing frontline worker jobs. Um, so, we knew they needed access to care, especially um, as they were showing some symptoms of COVID. It, it, we were trying to balance that with the health and safety of our staff, maintaining the health and safety of our patients. Mm -hmm. So we luckily able um, with some support um, from the state of Massachusetts, we're able to offer access to care through telehealth. Mm -hmm. uh, we made that transition, which was very exciting for us um, to, to make that transition just having that additional way to reach and interact with our patients um, who often struggle because they're working multiple jobs sure. or don't have transportation to be able to have an appointment through telehealth. Um, so we, we've had to adjust that way and continue to try and engage our patients in care. But, you know, it's a, like everybody else, we're trying to balance um, opening services, safety, getting patients in, understanding that patients maybe are hesitant to come in because we're still living under COVID. So yeah, right. it's, definitely been a, it's definitely been a balancing act. We are definitely focused on trying to re keep our patients engaged in care. You know, like everybody else has been talking about, so much was focused on COVID. Now we're trying to play catch up essentially right. and re engage our patients in things like hypertension control, yep. in for labs, um, diabetes control, really getting re-engaging them um, in that kind of medical care. As far as mental health, yeah, absolutely. I think um, we have a, a, a large uh, recovery services program, especially in Plymouth. And I, I think um, that's where we had to try and be innovative and continue to have contact with patients and really figure out how to make sure they got the care they need, they got the mental health support 
that they needed, mm -hmm. um, and all of our patients really right. need that extra support. So yeah, especially now. Like yeah. That increase, yeah. 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 And, and finally, what is your wish list for the future for Harbor Health? Well, we have some really exciting community programs, which uh, we've had this opportunity to expand as a result of the pandemic. I mean, really, you know, I think we've all heard the statement, you know, the pandemic has laid bare all these gaps mm. um, and, and really shown how, how fragile the day-to-day -day existence of many people are where they, I mean, just knowing how close you are to needing to access a food pantry, for example, um, no, just having those types of services available to, to folks is, is really critical. So we, I think one of our, our biggest areas of opportunity that we're really working hard within Plymouth um, is to make some of our community programs like our food pantry available. Um, we now go every other week to Plymouth. Um, people can, con you do not have to be a patient in mm -hmm. order to access those services. And our food pantry really helps people get through the month. Right. Um, we can connect them to um, SNAP benefits, which you know uh, it helps um, provide supplemental nutrition assistance so that you can make sure you get food on the table throughout right. a month. The, the month we have a brand new sexual and reproductive health education services clinic called the Thrive Clinic that we are looking to bring to Plymouth and and working with different community partners, welcome community partners. You know, sexual and reproductive health services is another kind of area during the pandemic that people just didn't have the same access to. Right. And trying to get them re-engaged, feeling comfortable, asking questions in a free, confidential way, mm -hmm. um, and then help them connect to care as much as possible. So, so those are two big areas that Excellent. we're focused on. Well, it sounds like Harbor Health does an awful lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're really, it's a really passionate group of people. We really care about the patients that we serve. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things I love about working there is that people really want the best for their patients yeah. um, and really help them get there. Right. Clearly, your passion shows through 100%. Thank you so much, Amy. Really appreciate you being here today. Yeah, thanks again for having us be a part of this. Sure. Thank you, Julie and Amy. To learn more about Harbor Health, visit hhsi.us. The Pembroke Council on Aging is partnering with the Pembroke Health Department to provide a flu clinic for all ages. They will have the regular dose and the dose for those over 65 available. Call 781-294-8220 to make your reservation. And once the council has received the doses, you'll be contacted to set up an appointment. There'll be no out-of-pocket charge just bring your insurance card. Have you been eating the rainbow? Marsha Richards, registered dietitian and community liaison from Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, Plymouth, has teamed up with the Duxbury Free Library to offer What's on Your Plate, an October 8th program scheduled from 12 to 1 p.m. Including a recipe demonstration and tasting, Marsha will discuss how research supports that eating from the rainbow of colors may promote a healthier you. South Shore Community Partners and Prevention provided funding for To Your Health, a cookbook containing recipes from our community. Each participant will receive a copy. Visit the Duxbury Free Library website to register. Styles and art evolve over the centuries in fashion, architecture, design, and cemeteries. On October 6th, from 7 to 8 p.m., join the Gravestone Girls and the Plymouth Public Library for Welcome to the Graveyard, a 90-minute illustrated virtual tour chronicling New England cemetery art, history, and symbolism. There will be local content from the cemeteries in Plymouth and an examination of why we have cemeteries and gravestones, why they look like they do, and how styles and art have evolved over almost 400 years. The talk will be presented in the Phalo Room of the Library. Visit the website for more details. Local Cultural Council grants have made it possible for the Native Plant Trust to offer an overview of the extraordinary diversity of native plant communities in southeastern Massachusetts. On Saturday, October 2nd, in the Phalo Room of the Plymouth Public Library from 3 to 4 p.m., learn about local plants' habitats, resources, and health status. Visit the Plymouth Public Library website to register.
Banned Books Week is September 26th through October 2nd, and to celebrate the right to read, the Kingston Public Library is hosting a Banned Books scavenger hunt for the whole family on September 30th from 3 to 7 p.m. The children's activities room will have photos of the covers of books that have been censored hidden all around it, and scavengers will be given a sheet with matching photos to find. Once you've found them all, show the librarian at the desk and receive a prize. While the program is for all ages, the book showcased will be children's books and appropriate for the room. Censorship divides us. Books unite us. Visit the library's website to learn more. Thank you for staying with us for this episode of Local Matters. From all of us at PAC TV, have a happy and safe week. We will see you next time. Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.